The average consumer is exposed to over 5,000 marketing messages a day. We see them, we hear them, we click and tap them. They're all around us, but for the most part, they're pretty fleeting. A banner ad that rotates for 15 seconds, or a digital billboard that loops every seven. And if you're like most people in the room, when you see something like this, it can feel like an eternity for those five seconds to pass. <laughs> That's why I find these so fascinating. You can uh, find them around the world. Maybe you've seen a fading ad on the side of an old brick building or a corner store down the street. You could have walked by them a thousand times, but have you really stopped to look? They're called ghost signs, and over the last few years, I've become obsessed, wandering around the city with my head looking towards the rooftops in search of these ancient relics. Um, I like to call myself an urban archaeologist. Uh, but what I do actually isn't all that unique. There are people around the world doing the exact same thing, researching, documenting these signs. And what I've come to find is that they tell an amazing story beyond the products and services they're promoting. Uh, each one, no matter where you find them, give us insights into the evolution of advertising. Now, I'm lucky enough to live in Winnipeg, Canada, and at the turn of the 20th century, our city went through an unprecedented boom. Uh, we were incorporated in 1873 with less than 2,000 people, and within 40 years, that number skyrocketed to over 150,000. We were the gateway to the West, Canada's third largest city, and one of the fastest growing places in North America. Now, after the First World War, for a variety of reasons, that growth slowed, but what we were left with is an amazing collection of turn-of-the-century warehouses and early skyscrapers, over 150 buildings spread over 20 city blocks. And on the sides of these buildings are ghost signs, some over 125 years old. So you might be asking yourself why they're still here after all the time, and a lot of it is because they're painted on brick. You see, uh, bricks are extremely porous. They're like sponges. When they come into contact with liquid, they tend to absorb it. Now, if that liquid is an oil-based paint with a high lead content, then those signs are going to stick around for a while. Even after the original signs have been painted over, after the years, they have a way of ghosting through. Originally, all the signs were, were just company names, and that's because about 150 plus years ago, your name was really all you had, and if people knew you and trusted you, you could build a business with little more than that. And that's all these signs were meant to do, is just let people know you existed. They were functional. If you had a product or services uh, you wanted to let people know about, you'd put your name on the side of a building. Now, one of the biggest names here at the turn of the century was a man named James Ashdown. Uh, he opened a humble hardware store in 1870 and within a few decades had turned it into a multi-million dollar enterprise. To get his name out there, he orchestrated one of Canada's first publicity stunts. Uh, he got uh, 40 rail cars, filled them with building material, and on the side of each car in big bold letters wrote hardware from J.H. Ashdown and Company. And he took those rail cars across the prairies to sell his wares. Now that's how he got his name out there, but if you weren't as savvy, how would you reach customers and new markets that have never heard of you? Well, a lot of people, what they would do is they would create a surrogate or a stand-in, a brand name. That's exactly what Ashdown did in 1904 when he introduced the Diamond A brand. You see, with a brand name, you don't mean to be tied to a real-life personality anymore. You can create your own. And that's when these signs really started to change from a name on a wall to a message. They weren't just for promotion anymore, they were for persuasion. They started adding call to actions to differentiate themselves, to drink or buy or use. They'd add messaging around their products to help stand out. In the 1890s, a man was on a train in New York City and he went by a shoe store offering 21 varieties of shoes. Well, he liked the line so much that he adopted something similar for his own business, and that's how the Heinz Company started offering 57 varieties of food products. And you can see their sign ghosting through the Pepsi one in front of it. Heinz was actually an early marketing pioneer. He put his products in clear glass bottles instead of cans so that consumers could see the product before they bought it. He hired artists and writers to work at his company and arguably built one of the first internal marketing departments. Uh, as advertising started to evolve, people started to get influenced by more and more messaging. So what would happen is that you'd create slogans around your products for people uh, to remember your product or service, like Goodwill did in 1921 when they introduced theirs. They'd also put uh, product claims out there, like Wilder Stomach Powder did, who offered consumers fast, long-lasting relief. Brands were being distilled down into uh, word marks and logos, simple identifiers that could communicate everything that your company is and offered at a glance, even after a century of wear has taken its toll. 
company started hiring sign painting businesses that would go town to town or city to city to paint the same signs over and over again to create brand consistency. Or they'd erect full-scale product replicas of uh, retail products on the side of buildings to create brand recall when you went down the aisle of your local grocery store. By the time the 1950s came around, you had things like uh, radio, television, um, direct mail, a dozen other mediums to reach the public. Campaigns were being rolled out at such a pace that sign painting wasn't feasible anymore, and they were replaced by things like vinyl banners or billboards. Today, the top 200 advertisers in North America spend around $140 billion a year to reach the public. But in five or 10 years, where will those ads be? How do you catalog a Facebook campaign? What staying power does a pre-roll video have? Go signs will outlast them all. So the next time you're walking down the street and you see a fading ad on the side of a building, take a moment and pause, because there's an amazing story right under your nose. You just might have to look up to see it. Thank you.